Larry Bunka from NetApp, uh, who's going to be presenting on the value of automation, um, kind of going through a little bit about you know what uh, NetApp is doing to address this. And that's going to be from 4 to 4.30. And then we're going to go over the general beer tasting from 4.30 to 5.30. So uh, with that being said, I wanted to again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, and uh, Larry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I am literally standing between you and beer. But, uh, but this does not need to stop you. Uh, I've been told I sound much better when people are drinking. So uh, please have a couple that uh, it'll, it'll, make the, it'll make the next uh, 20 minutes or so go, uh, go faster, I hope. Uh, at the same time, I want, uh, even though we've got the, the way the setup is here, I want this to be interactive. So I know you were invited to contribute into chat. Please stop me, uh, ask questions. Uh, this may be a familiar area to many of you. It may be, uh, it may be uh, completely new, uh, and it may, uh, uh, or it may be completely new hearing this from, uh, from NetApp and, and OneTech. So I did want to uh, thank the, the OneTech team for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm a product manager here at NetApp, and I have been, um, I've been here for about 10 years, and for the last six of that, I've been focusing on a couple of areas. One is uh, DevOps ecosystems integration. And the other part of that has been a very strong focus around automation. Uh, I'm gonna share my slide here. We'll get, all, get this all kicked off. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yep. Give me a nod of agreement. So, um, so automation is a you know is a pretty popular term out there uh, among te amongst technologists today. Um, uh, um, I'm specifically going to be talking about what NetApp's been doing in the last little while, but it's it's not just a NetApp thing. Uh, uh, most vendors in the IT space and and uh, pretty much every customer that I've talked to in the last five years has had some degree of interest in this. It's it's, it's so for that reason it's not new. Um, it, it, you know, it started to get really get popularized about seven or eight years ago when you heard of companies like Chef and Puppet that really were the first to approach this market with solutions that allowed uh, organized organizations to really kind of standardize uh, what they were doing uh, in terms of how they provisioned or managed uh, end user consumption. Uh, you know, the, 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 the challenge has been is, is, is has been that it's kind of a constant game of whack-a-mole of trying to uh, co continually optimize processes. And one of the things that has been a, a very kind of a, a point of, of frustration for um, uh, particularly for IT operations people has been, has been the, this uh, ongoing end, end user mantra of I want it all and I want it now in the words of the immortal Freddie Mercury. Um, and it's, it's this, kind of this instant gratification mindset of, of, of request fulfillment that has been really fueling the engine or uh, for uh, increased levels of automation and, incre and increasing the uh, sophisticated levels of automation. Part of this has been driven by uh, the experience that end users have been having uh, with cloud providers who are, who are highly automation and set a, a and set a, this, like three or four click to get what you want bar uh, uh, for, for, uh, for end users. Uh, the other part of it has been also uh, an understanding that uh, complexity in the IT environment has been growing exponentially, and, but the resources to, to support and manage it and certainly funding have not. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, if, if you're part of an operations function, uh, you're, you're probably uh, well attuned to the request of do more with less. Uh, and that's really the, the you know, the, the overlying challenge. W what this really is kind of being centered around is this transformation uh, around the, the way that uh, requests for resources are being fulfilled in IT environments. Um, uh, historically, I've called this the, the ask, wait, get model. And this kind of goes like this. I'm an end user, or you have an end user, and it could be uh, the, an individual or representing a team of individuals. And I'll I'll call this particular individual a development manager, and they 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 uh, want to uh, set up a development project, uh, and they have a requirement for some IT resources in order to get it done. And the first thing that they're told when they go to their IT organization is fill out a ticket. 
Um, and, and I think if, depending upon the type of IT organization uh, that you are and the level of complexity, that could be one ticket or it could be a cascading effect of multiple tickets where different parts of the requests go through several levels of approval before they're finally fulfilled. Each component of that request fulfillment may be doing an outstanding job and fulfilling their service level uh, agreements or exceeding their service level agreements. But the, the point about, about being lost, uh, this, not lost in this whole point from, uh, thing from the end user standpoint is there's a period of wait. And eventually the end user will get what they uh, get or hopefully get some version of what they ask for. And I call this the ordered mindset. And it's surprising the number of organizations that are still managing this today. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not done maliciously, but it's really kind of out of, a, a, out of a legacy of treating IT as a precious resource to be rationed. And you don't want the crazies running through the data center breaking stuff or using things without asking uh, because uh, that would just cause problems for everybody. So, so this ask, wait, get protocol is set up to kind of meter and manage what's going on. And historically, that was an annoyance, but it was never really a showstopper until we started to see the rise of things like DevOps. It wasn't unusual to see application development life cycles that were, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 weeks, a year, you know, a year, a year long for, for ma major development efforts. And when you were told that you had to wait a couple of weeks to get the resources to kick that project off. It was an annoyance, but it wasn't really a showstopper because a good project manager could make up two or 3% in that time frame. What's happened now is you're getting software development projects that are being measured in days and sometimes hours. The problem is, is the wait time to get the resource in order to do that has not changed. So instead of adding two or 3% to, to, uh, to the life of a project, it's adding two or 300 or two or 3,000 percent to the length of the project, which is now become un unacceptable. So automation is really a quest to move from this ordered mindset to more what we're calling a self-serve, which is the bulk of where the automation is happening today in a lot of customers, and ultimately into what I call embedded provisioning. And embedded provisioning is when there's no explicit request for a, for a resource. It, it just happens is, is probably the best expression where through, an, through an, an understanding either inferred from the nature of the request or the nature of the workload or through some type of, uh, of, a, of an analytics algorithm, it's possible to, to get uh, to, to, to deploy infrastructure uh, to meet the need without having to over specify the requirements. And, and this is, you know, this is, you know, really moving towards that I want it all and I want it now goal that most end users are seeking. And so this is really the balance that organizations are trying to strike. Strategically, this kind of look, looks like this. Um, the, the, there's nobody consumes infrastructure directly anymore. And feel free to disagree with me if you, if, if you will. But that's, 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 that statement is true probably 999 uh, times out of a thousand. Nobody writes applications to drivers anymore, at least not, none that I've seen in the last decade. Um, very, very often, uh, even uh, you know, today, end users are so disconnected from the, where the work that they're doing is being done that they, they make general assumptions about how work is being done uh, when in fact is being done in different ways. And that's because we've got several levels of abstraction now between the requester and where the work is being done. And most of those requests are now being fulfilled through three primary pathways, either through REST APIs or APIs in general, or where REST has become the open source standardized uh, preference for most organizations. It's, it's happening through orchestrators, uh, predominantly th th through things like Kubernetes or flavors of Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift and Rancher being examples, or it's having, happening through configuration management tools. The, the, the choices that are being guided in the market today are is generally is that there's a, been a move away from uh, vendor specific, platform specific proprietary tools towards tools that are open source cross vendor and cross platform. It's not because um, um, 
there was anything wrong with the proprietary approach in the past. It's just that um, as data center jobs and operations jobs get more complex and, and we're seeing a role, cha role changes happening where the person that was the storage admin gets a call into the office and they said, we've got a new job for you or a new title is infrastructure admin and you've got to do storage and network and server. And this is happening increasingly in organizations or they're being given a new title like infrastructure engineer. And so be, having the luxury to go steep and deep on a particular platform or a particular tool set uh, is no longer there. So tools like Ansible and Terraform and Kubernetes scratch that itch. Uh, they cross multiple, they cross all those platforms. You can use them on servers and network and storage. They cross multiple vendors, they're open source. Resources are more available. Uh, it's, 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 it's not too difficult to find skills in the market that can do that. Whereas uh, some of the other tools that are out there are, are, are more specialized and, and, and more, quite frankly, more difficult to resource. And so most modern I, uh, automation strategies are not based on a single tool. There is no such thing as one tool to rule them all. Um, they're based on some combination of APIs and orchestrators and configuration management tools. And, and, and the, the, the really advanced ones are defining this around largely a software defined infrastructure mindset where um, the configuration management tool uh, or, the, or the orchestration tool that sits on top of these things, um, once it's written to a, that, that software de de defined endpoint, there's a, a lot more flexibility in terms of where that endpoint run, uh, runs, whether you want to run everything in a data center or you're pursuing a hybrid cloud strategy or an all in the cloud strategy. Ideally, you want to be able to create an automation strategy that allows you to take advantage of all of those depending upon the application or the business need. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Are there any questions? Have you started drinking yet? All quiet. Yeah. <laughs> this would be that point in the in 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 the game of caps where I say everybody drink. <laughs> Everyone drink. That's a good. Everyone one. has to drink now. We got to know which ones to start with, though. Just start with water. Or if you have Miller Lite, Miller Lite. Really <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to get ahead of the curve on drinking and uh, and uh, and spoil your palate by starting on something too strong. So. Hey, so, so now I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about Ansible. Uh, the, reason, the reason for that in, 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 is, is for a few things. Um, we started our, uh, our investment in Ansible about four years ago. I, it, it wasn't because um, uh, we, and at the time, we also had some things that we were doing with Chef and Puppet, but th there was an interesting change that was happening in the market that has led to the popularization of Ansible amongst uh, among, amongst you know most of our customers and, and most of the market for that matter as it stands right now ansible has got about a 65 percent market share usage uh, when you compare that in puppet and chef both of which have got about uh, about 30 35 percent each and terraform which is last time i checked there were about 25 percent but i wouldn't be surprised if they were around 35 percent right now um, that's the way it, things look. Now, there's a reason that those numbers add up to more than 100%. Remember the point I made you earlier, there is no one tool to rule them all. It's because customers are using multiples of these tools. But we're, we're finding increasingly the reason that Ansible is so popular, particularly among uh, operations people, is that it's, uh, it's design, it's, it, in addition to being open source, it's designed uh, as an agentless tool. There's a lot of tools that are out there, and I won't name them, but that, that requ actually require you to install a software agent on the systems that you're acting on. Ansible does not require that. And, and, and that's a pretty powerful concept from a usability standpoint. It, uh, it, it, number one, it allows you to run things like Ansible uh, in a container, and there's lots of organizations that do that. Secondly, it doesn't necessarily require uh, the operations people to have ownership of systems that they may be responsible for deploying. And this is not an unusual uh, restriction 
in financial services environments or government environments where ops people have the responsibility, but not necessarily the authority over some systems that they have to that they that they have to provision. Uh, so it, it's it's very uh, uh, strong that way. The other thing is, uh, and and stop me. Uh, I'll do a quick poll. How many people are, know all about this with Ansible already? Or is this new, new stuff to you? New. New. Okay, great. All so right, I'll, so for the people that know Ansible, call me on anything that you disagree with. For the new people, you can ask the same questions as well. The other thing that makes Ansible uh, quite uh, unique as well amongst tools, it is when it's put together, it's... it's, it's um, the, the building blocks of, of Ansible are these things called modules. Think of, think of them like Lego blocks, okay? And um, when you snap two or more Lego blocks together or two more modules together, you create something called a playbook. Do this, then that. Um, and so you can build a little Lego snowman or you can go crazy and build the Millennium Falcon. It all depends upon what you wanna build. But the way that the build the, the the way that these playbooks are put together is they are procedural versus declarative. Um, and so I'll, a, a quick explanation on that concept: declarative is simply a statement. Uh, give me some of that. And how the declarative request is fulfilled is really up to the tool. Um, and so it could happen uh, differently every time. Uh, the, this is uh, this is great if you uh, for cloud-based platforms and tools and some or where you really don't care, but what the, the problem happens and it will happen eventually is something will break and it increases the complexity around what you have to debug because you not only have to figure out what broke you need to figure out the routine in which it was broken in in order to go fix it and resolve it and there's no also no um, way of preventing it from breaking again if a different declarative path is pursued. Procedural on the other hand is A, B, C, D, E. It's gonna happen that way every time. If B breaks, C does not happen and you're told B breaks and you can go fix it. Um, and for most people that come out of an ops center or have ever read a manual, guess how those manuals are written? Procedurally. Part step one, do this. Step two, do this. So translating the processes that exist within an IT environment into um, essentially the, the 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 procedural text that make up an Ansible script uh, or an or an or an Ansible playbook uh, is very very straightforward. It's also for organizations that have. Um, are pursuing things around our higher security protocols or where their provisioning processes have to meet security standards, it is a lot easier to explain a procedural routine to a security person than a declarative one. So, you know, you, you imagine having to answer the following question, what do you mean it happens differently every time? And, and de-risking that for your security people. It's, it's a difficult thing. So Ansible has this, this agentless and, and uh, procedural component. It's also got a property called item potency, which means it has the ability to run things over and over and over and over again, repeatedly from the safe, same baseline. It's able to return the constituent parts of the infrastructure that are redeployed to the same common base state. So you can avoid problems like configuration drift. And then it's built on open standards and open APIs and things like that, which I've already covered off. I'm gonna talk about this certified part in a second. The other thing is um, Ansible has a very quick learning curve. Um, I, that, I know that's easier said than done, but typically we're seeing people that have some knowledge of configuration management learn it is in, in as little as a couple of days. And at the worst case, it's a couple of weeks. And people, you can, it's a crawl, walk, run learning curve that's very easy to assimilate and apply. Uh, and, and, and because of this, you, you know, much faster time to automate, you can start chipping away at your challenges and the time to value is there. We're seeing organizations gain huge efficiencies in their operating environments. And as, as a result, they're able to expand and scale what they're doing around automation much more quickly. Um, there's a, a demo, and that's an option that you can pursue later on that, uh, that we give, uh, I have my TME, 
who's just a fantastic guy, shows this demo of a, of a fairly common routine that happens in most IT organization, which is, has to do with the configuration, configuration, uh, configuration depl uh, deployment pr uh, and provisioning of a cluster. Uh, in an IT environment. There's an, a number of other steps involved in there, setting up snap mirror relationships and then ultimately deploying that. When we originally did a use case, we surveyed this and for the average organization that was taking, uh, th th for, we did this across 24 uh, 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 major customers that were very uh, uh, um, seasoned ONTAP users. Uh, this took them about an average of about two days. Worst case was two weeks, average was two days. And even our own NetApp IT organization who does this dozens of times a day, it took them uh, an average of a day to do that. David shows a demo going through uh, over 80 steps in doing this provision. And he not, does it not only once, but twice in a little over three minutes uh, using, uh, using these automation templates. So. You know, you're getting, you know, in, in relative scale, you know, a day becomes about three minutes in, in, in this effort. Um, tremendous opportunities. We're seeing even new customers that are doing their first automations easily achieve 50 times. As a matter of fact, the slowest we've seen uh, is 50 times improvements in speed. So it's got some tremendous benefits there. So I'll start, any questions? Does this sound like science fiction? Okay. So certi what is certification? Um, I'll, I'll give a quick, a quick commercial for this one here. Um, open source is a great thing, it, but it also has its downsides. And Ansible very early on, uh, or about four years ago, started to run into some issues with the, 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 the open sourceness or, uh, of, the, of, of the way that they were uh, allowing people to build playbooks. And the problem that existed is those modules had to be created somewhere. And where they were largely getting created was in, in the open source ether. You would have well-intentioned engineers that would uh, create a module to do something. And they say, I'm a nice guy and I wanna contribute to the open source community. And so I'm gonna push this out into the GitHub ether, ether and I'm gonna share it with everybody, which was great. But this was happening thousands of times. And, and the problem that we were running into, and we were seeing this a lot uh, with NetApp customers, is they would want to build a playbook. And they, one of those components of the playbook, they would be looking for, for a, a, say, a module to create a LUN or to create a volume. And without a, a whole heck of a lot of effort, they would go to GitHub. And it was not unusual for, for them to pull back 100 or more modules uh, that all created a LUN or created a volume. And so it, it, it whereas the, the value was you could build automations from these pre-built components, the challenge now became, what one do I pick? Uh, and what, what, what's secure and what's been tested and what's not malicious and, you know, and what's licensed and you know, all these things. And, and so it just created, what it did is it moved the, the pain point to a different process and it, a part of the process. And it started to undermine the value proposition that was kind of promised around Ansible. So they created this community, uh, this process called certification. And the idea behind it was this, what if we could get a number of vendors that would be willing to step up and create a, a, a very rigorously developed uh, 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 modules that are tested and reviewed and licensed and go through Black Duck and all the things that you would do with a piece of enterprise code. And then also agree to go, go through code line level review with Ansible to, to create a, a category of modules called certified content or certified modules. And that's what we did about four years ago. And we were one of the, er, the original six uh, to, to do this. We were the first data management provider in that space. And in the subsequent three or four years since then, uh, we have become the largest provider of data management modules uh, uh, in the Ansible ecosystem. We, for a long time, were the largest, uh, the largest contributor amongst all vendors in, 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 in that environment. And we not only have uh, over 115 uh, modules for ONTAP, we've also got them for, um, for things like uh, 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 
Element Software, uh, Unified Manager, Cloud Volume Services, now Cloud Manager, uh, all these types of things. And we're, we're addressing probably over 95, 98% of the day one and day two functions that most customers require. Now, having said that, for most customers, that's 100% of what they need. And if this is, if this is new to you, it's, uh, don't be surprised. You know, certification has been a, 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 a poorly marketed thing by Ansible. It only in the last few months has it started to move forward and get a lot more visibility. But uh, today, uh, as it stands, since we've started, we have over 900 net, uh, uh, customers using our Ansible modules on about uh, over 14,000 uh, clusters and about that were, equates to somewhere in the neighborhood of 51 or 52,000 nodes today. Uh, and uh, it's been one of the most uh, fastest growing uh, tool adoptions in NetApp history and as we see cu our customers race to explore and expand on this stuff. So where does that leave us here? And you know, what is my dilemma when I talk to customers? Well, it's actually the customer dilemma that comes up more often than not. Um, we've got a lot of customers that are using Ansible, but, not, but, but uh, are not aware of what NetApp is doing in this space. And so we're working with partners like OneTech uh, to help get the word out and to help customers move along. The, the, other, the other part of it is that we've got customers that are still kind of on the fence with automation or are maybe using another tool and I've heard, I've heard about Ansible. And it, I've been trying to, you know, we've been trying to get them through the knothole of what to do. And, you know, one of the parts of it, I call it, a, you know, I call this a round barn problem. They're, you know, they're sitting in the, the customers are sitting in the middle of this round barn and their goal is to get out of the barn and they hear these voices screaming from the outside. And so it's, it's easy, just pick a corner. And the, pro the problem is, is that, um, you know, they don't see any defined starting point and they're struggling with that where to start. And that's what partners like OneTech and NetApp are helping our customers with. On the other side, there's this dilemma uh, of people that are fully utilized, which is I like it, I can you know I can see it, but I can't get there from here because I don't have time to save time. Um, and so we've constructed some uh, services, and I'll share some of the the, the resources that are available out, uh, out there. Uh, you know, so if if you're interested in talking about one of these things, you know, talk to someone on the the, the one tech team. Um, we can help you understand what the what the business case or the technical case is for for, for automation. Um, see if you ha if you're not familiar with what uh, uh, Ansible can do, ask for a demo. Uh, if if you're already there but want to learn more hands on about what to do uh, with NetApp, we have workshops. Um, uh, if you want to talk st strategy, I shared that slide earlier. We can talk about th uh, that. You know, a lot of this, as I said, is Helping our, helping our customers understand where to start and where to go. You know, really, you know, the, one of the customers I talked to a while back, they summed it up really the, the best way, which is, you know, we've got, our people are maxed out right now, but a lot of the things that they're doing are not really, in, you know, strategically or, 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 or beneficially that, you know, important to the organization, but they're, you know, they spend their days fighting fires. So, we, so their core rationale for pursuing automation of a strategy was to allow their limited resources to focus on the highest value priorities by automating away the low value mundane repetitious stuff. And that's, that should sound familiar to a lot of organizations because I don't think I've met anybody that's got uh, time to burn in their average work week these days. So uh, well, I won't go through this in a in a lot of in a lot of detail. Um, there'll be a, a resource slide uh, that you can follow up. We have um, a site called uh, NetApp.io. Uh, you can go. There's a how to get started series there on automation. You can look up what we're doing. These are all our open source contributions. There'll be several links here to uh, different resources if you want to link to the modules or the or what we have available today. And then you can, as I said, working with the one tech people, you can, we can work with you to design a plan on how to move forward. Thanks, so Eric. I'm going to end it there. Yeah. 
I appreciate it, Larry. Uh, thank you for, for all the detail and, you know, all the information around automation and what, you know, NetApp is doing. I guess, you know, the biggest uh, thing that we notice, you know, working alongside customers is, you know, we have the ability to, to use NetApp ONTAP in Ansible. Um, you know, it's a really great way to, to provide you guys with, you know, flexible uh, automation as well as transparent management. And it doesn't matter, you know, environment, regardless of size, you know, we're able to sort of create a story and, uh, we couldn't be more happy to have, you know, someone like Dave uh, help us architect, you know, these environments moving forward. So, you know, we've got obviously a lot of detail around that and happy to have a, another conversation after, after we get through some beer. How about that? Tara, you are up. Sounds great. Well, we're so excited again to have you guys with us. Hope you guys have those beers ready to go. Some glasses. Uh, I heard you got some glasses in your pack there so that you can pour them into those glasses. So I hope those are ready to go. And I'll go ahead and introduce you to our uh, beer expert, hailing from Brew Hop, San Diego's <laughs> best brewery tour company. Here's Summer. Hello, everybody. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Hopefully you are ready for a beer. As we mentioned, if you wanna come on camera, come off mute, come hang out, have some drinks with us. We also have some snacks to pair with them today that were picked specifically to go with these beers. I am gonna keep you guys on gallery view because I like watching you drink with me. It just makes me feel less alone. Um, so go ahead, we're gonna get started. Our very first beer that we're gonna get started with, if you haven't already gone ahead without me, is the Belching Beaver Miso Honey. This is a honey wheat ale brewed with local honey. So go ahead and grab that one. I do like to have a few glasses hand, handy so that one, I'm not hazing you and making you finish a 12 ounce beer in about 10 minutes, but also so that I can come back to and sample things that I've enjoyed and compare and contrast them. So feel free to grab a couple of glasses and I will take you through a logical tasting order. So if you're drinking later, this will give you an idea of how to go approach these. But as we pour them, I want you to notice a few things about each of the beers that we're gonna be trying today. I want you to notice the color, the clarity, the carbonation, and the head on the beer, as well as take a good smell of the beer before you drink it. A huge component of taste is smell. So I'll hold them up if you can't have a, if you have a solo cup and you can't see your beer in the red cup. Sorry, Jason. Um, <laughs> you just happened to hold that up at just the right moment. <laughs> um, so you're looking at this beer. This one has a nice, warm, slightly honey colored tint to it, almost orangey. It has a little bit of a haze on it. Could be because it's a little cold, but it, I think it's because it isn't fully filtered through. A very, very thin head. Notice how this does not really keep a head in my glass at all. That's pretty much dissipated. And medium-sized carbonation bubbles. Yep, yours too, David. See? Nice glass, by the way. I've got mine here, but I'm going to stick with the 8-ounce cup versus the full 16-ounce pour right now. <laughs> and as you smell this beer, do you notice the strong aroma of honey on the front end of this? Anybody out there smell the honey too? I do. Uh -huh. This one has a very pungent honey aroma. Not so much a sicky, sweet honey taste that lingers. There's a couple of different honey blondes I've had, honey wheat ales that I've had in the past. And this one has a much more upfront honey smell and not so much that it's coating the inside of your mouth and sticking around. If you swish it around your mouth a little bit, you might get a little bit on the roof of your mouth, but it's not overwhelming. Another interesting thing about this beer. So this is five and a half percent alcohol got a little bit of a bumped up alcohol than more honey beers than I've had in the past and 25 IBUs. So as we're going through this today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about what makes beer, beer, the ingredients in beer and some beer terminology that you might be familiar with but don't necessarily know what it means. Who are my home brewers in the group? Raise your hand, shout it out. Yeah. Looks like we got a couple. I think yep, I see I'm a couple a out there. Nice. Yep, small grain home system. Anybody else, anybody have something going right now that you've been homebrewing during quarantine stages? Yes, called a quarantine session. It was a single malt, single hop smash. Nice. What hops did you use? Nelson Savant and uh, Golden Promise for the uh, green. 
very, very delicious. I love the Nelson hops. Oh, no, um, awesome. Mike, yeah, I was no. going to say that toilet wine doesn't count as a homebrew. That's not well, that's not what okay, they're asking so the about. Second, is he in prison? The, the second try at a quarantine <laughs> session was definitely toilet brew. <laughs> not, in not in prison <laughs> anymore. No, I just went but, to a uh, home yeah. system, so I got an electronic controller, so I may have some ability to get some consistency, but we'll see. Matt's that's gonna definitely, get those sample. Yeah, that's definitely one of those hard things to do with home brewing that I found the biggest challenge is the repeatability yeah. of a great beer. You can make a great beer once, but trying to repeat it is so hard. And I don't know your name. Unfortunately, I've got you as QS. What are you no, brewing? Mike. Nothing at the time. Just haven't had time to actually get into it this year. This year of all years? <laughs> it's been a busy year. That's good. Very good. I am home with a six and a half year old and a 20 month old. It has been a busy year. I am not brewing right now either. Um, but as we're talking about some beer processes, if you're not as familiar, maybe you've been on a brewery tour and you've had a chance to see the equipment or you've been to a brew pub. If you have any questions, let me know. I can go down the rabbit hole and I can keep it as surface as need be. But basically there are four main ingredients in beer. Do you want to shout them out for me? Water. Water, yes. hops, yeast, malt. Thank you. And Desire. those up. Did you say cider? <laughs> I said desire. Oh, desire. <laughs> That's just the secret meaning behind it. So there are four main ingredients in beer. Mike called them out correctly. And those make up what is called the Reinheinskabut. That is the Bavarian purity law that states, if you're going to make something and call it beer, it must be those four ingredients. And that was enacted in the year 1516. So this has been going on a long time. In the year 1516, they didn't even know about yeast. Yeast was added in the 1700s when we discovered that yeast was what makes alcohol and that is incredibly important to your finished product. You never wanna leave that out. So we'll talk a little bit about the malted barley. We'll talk about the hops. We'll talk a little bit about the yeast, but we probably won't go down that rabbit hole too far. And um, water, I may make some snide comments about water and Coors commercials along the way. So <laughs> I have those too. But as we're drinking this one, this one IBUs measures international bitterness unit. That's gonna measure the back of the mouth bitterness that we get from early hop additions. So as we get into our pale ales and our IPAs, we're gonna hit some of those higher IBUs. This one at 25, it's kind of high for a wheat ale, a honey wheat ale but it provides a nice balance in this beer, keeping it from getting too sweet. Belching Beaver is a San Diego brewery, actually. They're based here out of San Diego. Who's heard of them? Yeah, they oh do yeah, that. been there. You've been there, which one? They've got a few locations here. I'm thinking uh, San Marcos. The biggie, the big one that was the, the old bank? Yeah, Vista or San Marcos, I can't remember. Okay, this, Vista has the old bank. San Marcos is a little bit smaller. Um, the 980 pub. They are North County based. They started yep. back in 2012 and they have been growing by leaps and bounds. One of their most famous beers is a peanut butter stout that they do and they have a few variations on that. But the miso honey is one that a lot of bars have on tap because it is very approachable. It's very easy to drink. It's not quite a session beer at five and a half percent. It's starting to get a little higher in alcohol. Um, but right now they've been distributing to 11 states, mostly West Coast states, but also Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. But the rest is all West Coast, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, and Nevada, all of that. So, so you will get coaster. some. What'd you say? I'm an East Coaster. You're I've an East Coaster. You East, have I've not seen these yet. Beaver. This is the first time I've had it. Yes. Yeah, it's good. It's it's a West Coast. Definitely oh, yeah. West Coast. Yeah. It does. That's where those 25 IBUs come in. That's where yeah. the, that little hot profile comes in. Mike, you just got to live a little mellow, man. It's West Coast. You gotta relax. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm Connecticut. There's no mellow here. <laughs> <laughs> come visit. You've got the beach scenery right there on your background. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll see. I'll go to, I'll go up to Maine and it's, yeah. It's cold. And it's a, kind of a weird beach. It's kind of large rocks. And... You need the, you need the bigger beers for the cold beaches. Here on the West Coast, it's a very good point. We like our hops. Most of our beers are going to have a significant hop presence. You don't even open a brewery in San Diego if you do not have a couple of good IPAs on tap. Even if the rest of your lineup 
is lagers and Belgians, you want to make sure you have a couple of solid IPAs because that is what people here in Southern California tend to crave. These guys, another thing that they're known for is they have been doing several collaborations with the Deftones, the band, the Deftones. And so right now they just released a new one that it's making its way across their 11 states. That is their Ohms Pale Ale that is going to be a West Coast style pale ale that announced the new Deftones album. So they have some fun, they have some fun. They try to be a little whimsical. They try to create a wide variety of beers for a wide variety of palates. That being said, I don't work for any of these breweries. I don't have, I don't brew any of these beers. So if you don't like them, it's okay to say you don't like them and they're not your thing. I am not offended. Everyone's palates are gonna be different with what we experienced today. So it's totally okay to tell me the truth about the beers. I wanna get us to our second beer real quick. I know we're gonna move a little quickly. I wanted one more sip because I love that honey. The one that you're gonna pair this with. Sorry, you have snacks. I almost forgot you have snacks. Did you guys grab your snacks for this tasting? I accidentally ate the Reese's two days ago. <laughs> and by accidentally, <laughs> you mean you totally <laughs> ate the Reese's? <laughs> well, it was either that or my wife got them. So <laughs> not going to have that. Survival of the fittest. I know. Yep. <laughs> well, my kid ate the Reese's and I totally forgot about the rest. <laughs> totally okay. We've got some um, honey roasted peanuts, actually, that go with this beer. One thing that I find really interesting when I pair honey roasted nuts with honey beers is inevitably it does not call up the honey as you would expect. It brings in a nice nutty balance to the beer. So if you have your snacks, go grab them and pair them with this. You'll wanna take a sip of your beer, a bite of your snacks, chew it all up and then try the beer again. Make sure you're breathing in through your mouth as well to get the whole flavor. But for me, I notice it calls up more of a nutty flavor than it does the honey. Tell me what you're getting. I see David, you just had the combo. I caught you with your mouth full, didn't I? It's like a good waitress. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I really wanted a response. No, and seriously. Did you you so let me ask you about your <laughs> So do you feel like it brought up the honey or do you feel like all of a sudden the honey is gone and there's this nutty malty flavor? Yep, it's a nutty and nuts and malt for sure. Love it. Me too. But it yeah, always... but, it, but it softened the peanut. So it's more of a rounded nut as opposed to just like strong peanut flavor, so. Yes, I do agree with that. It's just interesting that the pairings don't always call up what you expect. You would fully... Looking at it on paper, it seems to think that the honey would be called up, but the honey for me dissipates almost completely. And you get a nice soft nutty component. Now, if you have a nut allergy, I certainly hope you stopped yourself before trying this. I do wanna remind people. <laughs> um, we've got beer number two. If you're ready to go with me, we're gonna grab our Dale's Pale Ale. Who has had a Dale's Pale Ale before? I have, they're just down the, down the highway. Oh. Perfect. Are you in Colorado? Yes. Excellent. I live north of Longmont, so. Where they originally got started. Yeah. Hi, Gary. You too? You've had this one? Oh, yeah. Several times. In fact, my uh, one of my sons is sitting here next to me, and he's had far more than I have. <laughs> you know, this, this brewery got started back in 1997. And they are one of those craft breweries that has survived all of the waves of craft beer, where we lost several craft breweries in the late 90s. These guys were part of that first wave. And they have been innovators every step of the way. This was the first craft beer in a can. It really depends on where you got your drinking chops, but a lot of people have either gravitated towards Dale's Pale Ale or Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Pretty much everyone has had one or the other of those. Anybody out there not had this beer? This is new to you. Yes, perfect. I'm so glad there's a couple of you. Awesome. Are you on the West Coast or are you on the East Coast? Do you know they're in Brewery? Yeah. Your East Coast? Um, DC area. DC area. What about you, Joshua? Uh, Connecticut as well. Connecticut as well, okay. So yes, this one does have a much bigger West Coast uh, population who drinks it. 
If you look at the color, this one is definitely moving towards an orangey amber. It has a lot of those caramel malts, that caramel malted barley that brings in that soft orangish color. Another interesting thing to notice, you can see it on my glass if the focus is right. The higher hop content in this beer is going to create a lacing effect on the glass where the head sticks to the edges of the glass as you drink it down. That's an, a visual indicator of a higher hop content in your beer. Notice my first one, I'm gonna hold it back up. Not a single drop of hop sticking to the glass, no lacing whatsoever. Versus this one, which has lacing that's already started before I've sipped it. Go ahead and take a smell of this one. Gavin, I saw you follow all the right steps. What do you smell on this beer? Much more pungent than the last. <clears throat> Mm. But if you're looking like, you know, the inside of a cedar closet or, you know, a shoehorn type smell, no, I'm not going to go there. So. I love that you actually <laughs> just called up kind of the woodsy pine cedar notes that come out of the hops. I totally agree. There's also a heavy dose of citrus in there from the hops that come through. I think this one has it's one of those moments of this is what I love about beer or this is what I hate about beer for a lot of people when you get this hop profile. I have a Anybody? question in regards to that. Yeah. It seems like there's been a, I don't know, a higher frequency of IPAs uh, or companies that use more citrusy add-ins like grapefruit or orange. And it seems almost like they're trying to replace the hops with that instead. And I don't know if that's just because they're being cheap with the hops or, or they're truly trying to be creative. I don't know. I think they are truly trying to be creative. I'm giving them definite benefit of the doubt here because so many hops mimic flavors of pine or grassy or citrus or grapefruit or stone fruit or mango totally. and tropical type flavors. All of those flavors can be called up by the hops. And by adding in citrus to it, for example, you can bring out a mirroring of flavors that are similar and they go well together. I think it's more meant to be a complementary pairing of flavors than it is to be, let's, let's dull down the hops a little bit. Anytime I've seen it in the craft beer sector, it's meant to enhance. Now, if we're talking about Bud Light Lime, eh. <laughs> <laughs> it might just be that they're trying to appeal to some of those drinkers who want more citrus in there, but don't love the hops. I'm not it even sure if they use a real lime, but that sorry, what would you say, Jason? It seems like Bud Light Lime is the accident. Be like, oh, I thought you'd enjoy this. No. No. Really. <laughs> What's the one that had the Super Bowl commercial that when 2020 gives you lemons and they're all getting pelted with lemonade to make lemon? It was Bud Light Lemonade, I want to say, or is that right, Coral? Yeah, yeah okay. Really good. Yeah, I commercial. think it was for their seltzers. Yeah. Okay. I was almost actually tempted to go buy it. It was a good commercial. What? <laughs> Come on. It says Maven, not Beer Dud Summer. Okay. I can track my last Coors Light to about 13 years ago. So. Ooh, okay. I am going to challenge you on that one because if you haven't been to the Golden Brewery and had it there, it's, it's a life-changing experience. I, I will give that a try the next time I manage to make it to Colorado. I have not been to Colorado in years. I was actually born in Boulder, but I have not been back since I was three, maybe. So it's on the list of beer cities to go drink. So I'll give them a chance at the brewery. But I, I literally stopped drinking Coors Light 14 years ago. <laughs> I second that. So Coors Banquet from the source is amazing. Okay. Kind of like Guinness from the source where you must try it. Yeah. So Got it's it. kind of like going into the stone brewery and saying i'm not an arrogant bastard fan like they don't they don't like it like you need yeah. to say i love this stuff here so it's a, a lot of coloradans on i'm just gonna all right i will give it a try i will <laughs> i will travel for beer i will i will go places and seek out beer so i will definitely do that it's one of my favorite things to do is to travel to places and taste the local stuff oh yeah i'll yeah, give them a Vermont. oh definitely Yes, the East Coast has been a completely untapped market for me to go drink at the source. Oh, you got to go to Burlington and then Stowe. The I want to go to um, Asheville, oh, yeah. North Carolina. Yeah, Asheville, North yeah. Carolina. That's what I was going to say. 
That's oh. definitely on very high on my list. And I've mm. actually heard Florida has been really kicking some butt as well as Atlanta, Georgia. I have a friend who started a brewery over there called New Realm and they are opening up in Virginia Beach at the Old Green Flash facility. They bought it for an amazing deal. And so you'll be getting them over in Virginia Beach and all over the East Coast as well. So I have a lot of drinking to do when the world opens back up. <laughs> no question. <laughs> um, the pairing for this beer. So if you're ready to move on to your next snack, I have them all in little snacks here, so I'm not opening packages, but this one goes with the mustard pretzels. What I love about the pairing is the tart citrus of this beer. They use a proprietary blend of hops in this beer, so they don't tell you what hops they use, but it's definitely some of the cheater hops, the sea hops, your Columbus, Citra, Cascade, those kinds of traditional Northwest hops, and they pair really well with the tart mustard saltiness of these little pretzel bites. I will only do one of these because they're very loud when I eat them. So <laughs> it's for science, but you can hear me chew. <laughs> Good time for toast, Tara. Actually, I was going to say, minute. while you're chewing, how about we go ahead and do a toast? And when we do our toast, we're going to go ahead and take a picture. So take that time to turn on all your videos so we can get a nice photo of everyone doing the cheers. And uh, I think we're throwing it over to uh, Marsha for that toast. Hi everyone, I'm Marsha from Tech Data. I cover the NetApple line of business and work with One Tech closely um, and helped with this event. So um, wanted to raise our glasses. I'm actually, I'm pregnant, so I'm not drinking, um, but I'm enjoying it. And I have my coconut water right here to, to share in it with you all. Um, so if we would raise a glass, this has been a tough year for us all. I am, I'm safe to say um, with everyone on the call, we've had our challenges, um, but going into 2021, it looks so bright. And we have, a, we've made it, we're here, we can do it. And I just know that there's great positive things along the way for all of us. So um, whatever that may look like for you in your life, if you would take that and just envision it and know that it's coming to you and that it's happening. Um, and we will cheers to a positive 2021. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Cheers. Thanks. I totally agree. It's like every month of 2020, we waited for the weirdness to continue between the murder hornets and, you know, everything that went through. Every month had its new theme. 2021 is looking pretty good, <laughs> actually. We were going to go to our next beer. If you guys are ready to come with me on our next beer, I want to make sure we cover all four of these in the time allotted. How did you like that pairing before we move on? The mustard. I love the zestiness of it with the salty pretzels. Everyone is now chewing loudly and refusing to come off of mute because of it. <laughs> I, I thought it was really nice. It brought out some of the more um, kind of apricot or pear esters that I was getting. It's really nice. I really love the, the pairing of the two because there's just this bubbly, citrusy, mustardy thing going on. I love pickles. So anything that's acidic and tart works for me. So... That's where this one hits for me for sure. Are you eating a pickle? Is that what you just showed me? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We would get along just fine. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and move us to our next beer. This one is our Avery Brewing Company. This is also out of Colorado and they started in 1993. So part of that 1990s wave of craft brewers. Those are the breweries that are making up some of our backbone breweries nationwide. Those are your Oscar Blues, Avery, Stone, Alesmith, Ballast Point. All of these started in the 90s. Pyramid, Red Hook, all of them. Some have changed hands. Some are no longer considered craft breweries. Some are still independent. Um, Avery falls into the category of no longer considered an independent craft brewery. Did you guys know that? And I went the route of New Belgium. No, no, Avery was, they had a 30% share acquired by Mahau San Miguel, who bought a 30% share. And the limit in the 
Brewers Association is 25% being owned by somebody who is not an independent craft brewer, whether that's a venture capital firm, a distributorship, anything. So if you have gone beyond a 25% share being owned by somebody else that's not a craft brewery, you no longer qualify for the craft designation. Now, Adam Avery, who is the founder of Avery Brewing, doesn't really care. He doesn't care if you think he's craft anymore. They have not changed their processes, their ingredients. What it did is it simply gave them an influx of money when they needed it. And it's allowing them to be a little more versatile and a little bit bigger distribution, which is important with nearly 8,200 craft breweries in the country. They needed something to move them to the next level. And that was this. And it helped finance their gorgeous new building and their new facility that they bought. And they've been very happy with it. And a lot of craft brewers and craft beer drinkers don't really care that they've been acquired because they know that they're still standing on their own two feet as well. And it's not like they were bought by one of the big three who's trying to change them. Yeah, hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully that won't happen because I have had drinks with Adam Avery. He's a good dude and he makes great, great beer. So this one, you notice the color. We've moved into straight up hazy lemon yellow, bright yellow, cloudy. It is not something you can see through anymore. So this is going to be unfiltered. This is a hazy-ish IPA. The yes, ish, the, yeah, the ish implies it's kind of a hazy. This is not a New England style hazy. It's not going to be full of juice and pulpy, fruity flavors. They call this hazy-ish. It's very hop forward. Do you guys want to yell out what you smell? I get a lot of tropical fruit type smells out of this, almost pineapple. Yeah, I smell more fruit than hops. Mm -hmm. My fiance said beer. Yeah, definitely beer. citrus. <laughs> she is going to be correct for every beer that we go through today with that answer. <laughs> that is not a wrong answer. <laughs> Did she like the one before this, the Dale's Pale Ale? Yeah. yeah. One cool thing about Dale's Pale Ale and the entire Oscar Blues company is they launched a company called Canarchy that has been buying shares of independent breweries as well as creating really cool beer technology. Who out there has seen a crowler machine? Oh, me. Absolutely. Crowler? Crowler with a C, not a G. Yeah. Oh, they're really large cans. The really large ounce cans, can. 32 Boy, ounce baby. usually, but yes, yes, big cans. 32, actually, yep. I actually went to a brewery in Idaho. They did 16 ounces. Oh, so they, they packaged up a four pack for you right there. That was awesome. Nice. Barbarian well, brewery. I don't the, remember the Sam whole... Adams talking about their crowler machine, but they had a lot of them there when we visited. So, so the crowler machine was invented by Oscar Blues. They own oh, the really? patent on that machine. They, when they started Dale's Pale Ale, it was the first craft beer in a can. And as you've noticed over the last five to seven years, most craft breweries are putting their beer in cans. It is better in terms of shipping weight. You pay less in shipping. You lose less in breakage through transport. It protects it 100% from light and being light struck. Mm -hmm. And it protects it from oxygen when done right. It keeps the air out completely. Even better than a crown seal on a bottle. Keeps and no air. bad flavors from plastic. Exactly. So the BPA, BPB technology evolved so that it's no longer lined with anything dangerous to you. And it doesn't enact, interact with the liners of the inside of the can to create any weird flavors. So we're getting good beer out of craft cans. And you started to see that a lot more. And then about six months ago, suddenly a lot of breweries had to shift back to glass because when March happened and shipments from overseas got slowed or manufacturing got slowed from overseas, we wound up with a huge can shortage in this country. So a lot of breweries had to switch back and forth between glass and cans, mostly because all of us were drinking at home instead of off of kegs. We were buying whatever we could to take home and drink here. Um, so you're going to see that go back towards cans. But that whole technology was invented by Oscar Blues. So now I'll go back to Avery. Oh, and Crowlers are 32 ounce cans to go. For those of you who don't know, when you go to a brewery and they fill up a can to go, that Crowler machine that seals it right there on site, that's an Oscar Blues invention. So back to Avery. Let's go ahead and drink this one. Who has, who's already started drinking this one and tried it? 
to you people? Mm -hmm. It's a very mild hazy. Have you had those East Coast New England style IPAs? Yes. I would think my Connecticut folks, my DC folks, yes? Yep, I've had that like, yeah, every day. Hogfish. <laughs> every day. Every day, Sorry. breakfast. <laughs> and being honest. Um, this is not what I would consider a New England IPA. That's why they call it a hazy-ish. It is right. nowhere near as juicy and chock full. It's kind of a baby hazy, in my opinion. It uses Amarillo hops and Simcoe hops in the boil, That's and then it is dry hopped with Amarillo, Azaka, and Mosaic hops. It, it doesn't have a lot of kick for something that was dry hopped as well. Super low bitterness. So dry hopping is going to give you that <clears throat> nose, that aroma. And that hop forwardness. Yes. That you get out of the New England set. <laughs> yes. And very low bitterness on the back of our mouth. But it does have 69 IBUs. So it's not that they're non-existent. It's 7.0 ABV and 69 IBUs. So it's very balanced in terms of its alcohol and its bitterness, but it is mostly hop forward with low back of the mouth bitterness. And it drinks like apple juice. <laughs> that soft mouth feel, right? It's super yeah, it just goes when you're drinking it's, it, right? They're dangerous mm -hmm. beers. That's all I can say. <laughs> they certainly are. If, so if you want to swish this one around a little bit in your mouth, this has a soft mouth feel. What they did is they added both wheat and oats, flaked oats into this recipe. The oats. And the oats give it a softness on the mouth. I call it kind of a, a viscosity. A viscosity. The mouth feels that little viscosity. Yeah, a thickness. It, 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 it's a nice mouth feel. Okay, so I'm kind of, kind of partial to the New England. <laughs> you said you're also on the East Coast though, right? Um, yeah, Connecticut. We don't get a lot of the true New England style IPAs out here in San Diego. They just don't ship them this way. We don't get a lot of Treehouse. We don't get a lot of Heady Topper. Um, we get our hands on a few cans every once in a while. So there's definitely a difference between the New England styles and the West Coast hazies. They're not the same category at all. They don't ship well. That's the biggest problem. They do if you have good friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, treehouse. So I, I, yeah. So before this event, I had a, I had a couple treehouse beers. Uh, I'll admit it. The Julius or something else. Um, we had a Julius and a, another one called Beginner's Mind, which oh. was an, an early um, recipe that they had when, you know. What <laughs> early? Oh, okay. So that came out what five years ago? I was gonna say they're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, but my God, have they grown? I would say a lot of our stuff here on the West Coast that is leaning that direction, which gives us a New England style IPA, but done in a West Coast twist with a lot more hops. We would say modern times or field work brewing are kind of our or monkish are kind of our West Coast equivalents to what you've got out there. Yeah, and I would call that putting your palate into submission. <laughs> That's the West Coast, right? Yep, always has been. So who's loving this beer? Who's kind of not feeling this beer? Okay. All right, Joshua, on you're loving this one? Could use a little more bitterness on the back end. What am I supposed to be eating it with? This one goes with the Duke's sausage and the little cheese. These, these are like dehydrated cheese chips. They're really fun. For me, I like the fact that the hazy IPA cuts through the fatty, sausagey smokiness. I like that pairing of the more meaty, fatty, gristly type things with IPAs because the citrus and the acidity tends to cut through that fattiness and give you a refreshing taste on your palate. I also love these little Duke sausages. Out here, we get them at Costco in the big bags. These are all nitrate-free antibiotic free. They're really delicious. Um, they're like an elevated Slim Jim, for lack of better description. <laughs> Who doesn't like nitrates? Right? The more nitrates, the better. It preserves your skin for the long haul. <laughs> mm, so I'm chewing a little bit of this. Go ahead, Joshua. So so the, the fun fact for the, the Treehouse fans, um, 
uh, late 2019, they bought um, quite a few acres of um, apple trees about 15 minutes up the road from me. So my hunch is by next year, they're gonna be starting a cidery. Um, they're building another location. So they have, what they moved and now they have a second location that they're building and they have the third farm stand location where they're doing produce and about a hundred acres of apple trees. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a tree house cider in the next two to three years. That sounds like a very smart transition for them because when I heard their name at first, I expected them to be a cidery. Hmm. It seemed like that would have gone hand in hand, but I think that that's a, gr there's a lot of new yeah. cideries coming to market, both because people who enjoy gluten-free beverages can drink cider and the craft cider market is so small right now that you really, there's a lot of big cideries out there, the Widers, the um, Anthem, but there's not a lot of craft tiny ciders doing it right locally. We just have just a few here ourselves. And the majority of our apples, any cidery that I've got down here, most of the apples still come from the Pacific Northwest. So it's very cool that they would be doing their own orchards to grow their own fruit. I look forward to trying that. Who's ready for one more? I know we're moving through them quickly. We got one more. This is our dessert beer. This is the one we're gonna pair with the Reese's peanut butter cup because chocolate and peanut butter are delicious in our stouts. If you happen to have already eaten your Reese's, which I heard a few of you did, if you have vanilla bean ice cream or chocolate ice cream or cookies and cream, even coffee ice cream, if you have any of those in your house, this beer makes an awesome beer float. What have you got there? Pecans. Caramelized pecans. They're fantastic with stouts. <laughs> yes, they are. Very nice. I heard- um, I'm sorry. Walnuts. I actually heard walnuts become almost untastable when paired with beer. Just a weird, interesting fact that they lose all flavor when you pair them with beer. The caramelized pecans would be delicious. Yeah, grab anything you've got for dessert to go with this beer. <laughs> so as we pour this one, this is Fremont Brewing's Dark Star Oatmeal Stout. And you'll notice no light is getting through that beer at all. I have a very powerful light right here in front of us, nothing not even at the corners of my glass. Maybe I'm getting a tiny hint of deep dark brown right at the edges of my glass. The head is a light tan color, light brown color. It's nice and fluffy with little dense bubbles. So that tells me there's probably small carbonation bubbles in here. And on the nose, Gavin, you wanna tell me what you smell in this one? Thank you. Honestly, it almost smells a little vinegary. Chocolate. Okay. But who knows, I might just be tainted after so many years. <laughs> Does anybody smell some dark chocolate or coffee aromas? Coffee, definitely. I'm seeing David's fiance over there nodding her head at my coffee and chocolate. The first thing she said was chocolate. And then she said dirt. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's what I'm smelling. <laughs> You're smelling the earthiness of the beer. <laughs> it's a coveted flavor profile. It is. Sure. It is. Chock full of minerals. <laughs> so as you're drinking this, what I love about this beer, first off, I love Fremont Brewing. They have a special place in my heart. Fremont, I'm from the Seattle area. I grew up in Seattle in the 90s, which means I like really grungy music which my friends say is super <laughs> depressing. I like lots and lots of coffee and I like craft beers. So I hit all the high notes of Seattle in the nineties. Just embody that. Um, I'm not seeing anything wrong with that. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, Some I'm of my friends say the music selection is terrible. I'm on the opposite side, but the weather is the same. So it's the same kind of mood. It is. There's it a is, reason totally. they sang the way they sang. Absolutely. And we dressed in flannel. I'm telling you. You cannot wear a flannel and Doc Martens in 72 degree weather in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> you can in Connecticut, though. <laughs> Guarantee it. 
Yeah, Summer, I, I grew up in Seattle in the '90s as well. If you hear, if you hear uh, uh, Pearl Jam playing lightly in the background, I I can't. But I am so glad I've got somebody who knows exactly what I'm talking about. They're in Seattle. <laughs> uh, Redmond, yeah, that was you, isn't it? Yeah, I knew that was. Yeah. <laughs> what, can I ask what year you might have graduated high school around Seattle in the '90s? Uh, Two thousand. Okay, I'm older than you, but <laughs> I was close. So yeah. yes, you are exactly at the same time. It was an awesome time to grow up in the Pacific Northwest. And you remember my first craft beer, I might've been 14 and it might've been a pyramid apricot wheat. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> a- absolutely. They're half too. Exactly, because that's what was in the fridge of the parents that we were swiping it from. Yes, <laughs> it would actually grow oh, an apricot so on the bottom if you left it long enough. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't stick that long around our house but we had we had the pink floyd laser show we had all of that nice. um oh, so was, like your parents are my age yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> um it was it was Sorry. definitely full immersion experience growing up in the 90s and that is carried through to my palate through today I am still highly caffeinated on a regular basis and still have a very soft spot for a pyramid and all of those Northwest beers. Fremont, I like to visit when I go back home. My whole family is still in Seattle. So I go home in non-COVID years about once every three months to see family. And Fremont has done a great job. They have a huge outdoor patio overlooking the Montlake Cut in a little neighborhood north of downtown Seattle, near the university kind of. And they have a huge effort to make sustainable processes around their brewery. Brewing is a very wasteful process in general when it's done on an industrial scale. It takes about it five, have to be. pardon? Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be, no. no but all, on those, the... all, those, all those waste grains, chicken feed, dog biscuits, all sorts of crap can be made out of it. It's, it's and awesome. hopefully yeah. most breweries are operating that way. Fremont is operating that way. They send 10,000 pounds of spent grain which is the malted barley that you run the hot water over. You yeah. suck all the color, flavor, and sugar out of it to create your vort, your base beer, before you boil it. All those grains are then sent to a local farmer, 10,000 pounds of grain a day, go to a farmer for chicken feed, pig feed, cow feed, all of that, because it still has usable sugars and nutrition in it. And most After a day, I give it to my chickens. Per- you have your own chickens? Yes. Well, it's not my chickens. They're my wife's chickens. That's really cool. I said no to chickens, but she brought them home anyway. I absolutely had a chicken growing up in the 90s in Seattle. It's it's weird. I am with you. Um, <laughs> so you, you want to do these sustainable to practices. You want to make sure that your brewery is doing these things because it takes about five to six gallons of water to brew one batch of beer between cleaning, sanitizing, all of that. Oh my so, God, yes. People like Stone here in San Diego, they built an entire water reclamation plant so that they're treating their own gray water there on site and selling it back to the city. Fremont is working with my alma mater, Washington State University, in order to develop and bring back malted barley or barley cultivation to Washington State. They're working on organic methods for farming barley, and they're working on developing organic methods for hop farming and using those in their own beers whenever they can. And Washington is probably one of the largest hot producers in the country anyway. Definitely. Washington, Washington, Oregon, Oregon, and Idaho. Yeah. Yes. And most of Idaho's are owned by Anheuser InBev. So we don't drink that. Pardon? We don't drink that. (laughs) (laughs) At least not knowingly, right? (laughs) I just don't know. We don't drink that. He told everyone about Bud Light Lime. He kept raving about it. I did. I did tell everyone. But, and the thing is, in 2016, Anheuser InBev went on a huge buying spree. They bought up, they bought up a huge share of a technology company called Rate Beer. I heard somebody mention on the presentation earlier, Untapped, um, in the beer world, there's a website called Untapped. There's another one called Rate Beer. And Rate Beer is a consumer forum where you enter your thoughts on how a beer tastes, your consumer thoughts. And what the technology arm of Anheuser InBev did is they bought a 30% share in that company very quietly. And they farmed it for data for months. The news of that acquisition did not happen to get out for six months. 
So they had six months of good data to use. Once people found out, they started submitting crap data, lies and stories and beers that didn't exist and thoughts on breweries. They started messing with the data because you're only as good as your data. But there was six months right there that allowed them to have a treasure trove of people's thoughts. And they took that time to mine who were the small and interesting breweries to purchase next that they could get for a good price who had clout and who were gaining popularity. So they went through and they purchased um, Elysian out of Seattle. They purchased 10 Barrel out of Bend, Oregon, Golden Road out of Los Angeles, Four Peaks out of Arizona, Revolver out of Dallas, Wicked Weed out of North Carolina, really? uh, Breckenridge out of Colorado. No. Yes. <laughs> okay, and that's why we do not drink anything from InBev. <laughs> It's a huge no. list. No, it's a bad, it's the evil empire. Okay, it's like the Google and <laughs> beer industry. You just don't go there. But, but put a happy spin on it and say that they're actually helping some of those smaller breweries actually stay alive. But the reality is, yeah, they just needed to diversify. They, they developed a very cool distribution network of very great beers. And they did that because people had stopped drinking some of the big threes beers. The younger markets are drinking craft beer. The boomer market are drinking craft beer. And what's interesting is as they got these acquisitions, all of those beers became available nationwide through the Anheuser InBev network, which is very good for them to get deeper pockets and a better distribution network. And it probably did keep a few of them from going under for sure. Um, so you whether you think it's- here. Yeah, whether you think it's Evil brewery. Empire, Pardon? We've got a tin barrel brewing uh, um, restaurant brew house here. And the food's delicious. The beers are great. Where are you located? Denver. Denver. Oh, yeah. I would guess there was probably a lot of customer backlash to that opening the way it was here in San Diego. When they announced they were opening a tin barrel here, people literally crowdfunded a banner to fly over that said tin barrel is not craft beer. Uh, by airplane wow. because Amazing. and it's it actually closed in the middle of last year 2020 it actually closed it never took a foothold here yeah drink local a lot of people believe strongly in drink local and Absolutely. i'm not here to change your mind one way or the other on that but <laughs> i like informed consumers who know who owns their companies mm -hmm. and they did do a huge I'm buying you on that. yes um so i like supporting independent whenever possible and Fremont is definitely that. And they are doing a really good job of staying that way, even through innovation and changing. If you keep an eye out for them, one of their favorite beers that they put out year round is their wet hop ale that they release. It comes out in September. It uses fresh, fresh, fresh hops that have been harvested in the Pacific Northwest and are brewed within 72 hours of harvest. So oh, they get shipped good. overnight. Yeah, it's amazing what they're able to produce because they're so close to the source. <laughs> I'm going to open it up for beer questions. I know we've given you a ton of random beer knowledge. You are all going to win beer trivia when the bars we open where you live. But I am here for your beer questions or beer thoughts. So please come off mute, talk to me, even just, hey, I love this beer. Where can <clears throat> I get it? <laughs> Have a nostalgic. I'm going to drink this stuff. I have a nostalgic recollection and question. New Belgium used to have one they called Transatlantic Krieg um, that was done in open air vats in Belgium and then shipped across the ocean and they completed the processing on, on this side. And I was wondering if there were any other companies that still do something similar. There are a couple that are starting to use a cool ship here in San Diego that I know about. But nationwide, you might be able to get your hands on Cantillon is one. It looks like it's spelled Cantillon. Cantillon is one that comes directly out of Brussels in Belgium. They've been producing them there for over 120 years. And they are done where they, they, they make the raw beer, they brew it, and then they pump it up into the attic into what's called a cool ship, which is about... 10 inches deep copper vessel, wide copper vessel. And they open up the shutters 
and they turn out the lights and they leave it overnight and the night air in this one neighborhood in Brussels blows in and the yeast that lives in the air in this neighborhood goes into the beer. The next morning they show up, they package it in virgin French oak barrels. So nothing has been in it before. And they sit on it for a year to three years and even some even five years. And they let it develop naturally with the yeast that exists in the night air in the months of April through October, the warm months. Those are the months that they brew. You can still go visit this brewery in person. It's in this weird little neighborhood in Brussels right off the railroad tracks with like an equivalent of Ross next door where you can buy a suitcase to take your beer home for like $10. Um, and they will give you a brochure and let you go wander the brewery when it's available for tours. But they use wild fermentation of open vats with the night air of that one region. And it's, so it's Cantillon. You can sometimes find them across the country in good barrel shops. Um, somebody asked about Chimay, that you asked pronounce, pronunciation of Chimay. That's how I you remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I grew up in Houston, so you don't want me trying to pronounce it. So I'm like, let me ask <laughs> someone who probably didn't go and get public educated uh, in Texas. So <laughs> Chimay. Yep. That's that's how, and Duval is Duvo. And um, the one that's a number three and then a word that starts with an F that looks like fountain is Trois Fontaines. That's a Belgian one that you might see coming through. J Jason, it's pronounced Shinerbach. That's right. <laughs> Who had two kegs of Shinerbach at his wedding? This guy. <laughs> <laughs> so are the, are the diesels electric that go through that neighborhood in Brussels? Or do you get smog controls? Or do you get the flavor of... Uh, you get the, get the weird the little neighborhood right next to the train tracks is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> that has been there for 125 years. And if they move their brewery, it would change the taste because it is the yeast that exists in that neighborhood. It's the original right. way of... That was, a that was a really good answer, though, and very specific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get your hands on it, it has a very funky taste, but it's very cool. Another easier to attain option for you, Gavin, if, especially if you're ever in the, the East Coast, um, in Massachusetts, uh, Spencer um, is a, a, one of the few uh, US-based Trappist style uh, breweries actually still run by monks. Awesome. And the, the Trappist ale that they produce is really good uh, for being open cask. And, and you can go, um, you can actually go for a weekend for kind of a, a secluded getaway and, and kind of live like a monk for a weekend in a little secluded area with no cell phone service if you're really- No, you're really no thank you. And you drink free beer, so. <laughs> As I mentioned, I've been doing distance learning for a first grader for a year and have a toddler at home. That sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Gary right, asked um, in the chat, what are some of my favorite San Diego breweries? And I have many. If anybody is visiting San Diego, you can always email me directly. Um, you can find me at brewhop.com. I'm not going anywhere, but I can give you specific uh, suggestions for what might work for your palate. But my favorite San Diego breweries, I have a running top five. I love going to Stone because they have about 30 of their beers on tap and at least 15 to 20 of other great craft breweries on tap. And you can get taster flights. They have a bottle list of over a hundred and phenomenal food and grounds. So I love visiting the stone brewing locations that are the big restaurant locations. I love Pure Project for tiny and new and interesting and innovative breweries. They're small, they're nimble, and they are creative with an excellent craft brewer. I love Wild Barrel for their kettle fruited sours. They are heavily fruited with fresh local fruit and they are punchy at about six to 8% alcohol each. I love Lost Abbey and Alesmith because they both brew balanced, flawless beers where you can pick up anything from their assortment and know that it's going to be a beautiful representation of the style and a great beer. Anything from those breweries I've loved. So it's like picking a favorite kid, I can't. There's <laughs> too many favorites. Are awesome. you visiting the area or 
close enough. To I, I'm from San Diego and oh. I go there frequently. And my son is actually a brewer for uh, for Miller Coors and um, in a brew lab in Atlanta at the at the baseball stadium. So cool. he's a professional brewer at a brew lab. And his favorite brewery in San Diego is uh, Modern Times and followed by Society. Oh, those are both awesome breweries. Um, yeah. Let him know that society has started canning this past year in the pandemic. So they've been doing actual cans that you can get their IPAs outside of the brewery for the first time ever. They are awesome. He has great taste. He has phenomenal taste. Modern Times, I mentioned earlier, has some of our best West Coast hazies. They also have a great sour program. Yeah, he's got he's got stellar taste in San Diego beer. <laughs> it is the dream about Ballast Point. <clears throat> what about Ballast Point? Yeah. What it, <sighs> Ballast, it Point, <laughs> Ballast Point has been through some transitions, and I am yeah. now a fan again of Ballast Point. I was not a fan for a few years while they were owned by a large company, but they were bought by a small company called Kings and Convicts out of Illinois recently, and they are doing some very cool things with small batch beer again. Are they back really to like, what they were? Yes, yeah. exactly. That's kind of cool. It is really cool. They just announced today that they'll be opening a brew pub in San Francisco instead of, and closing down their Chicago Loop location, which is an interesting choice cool. for an Illinois-based brewery to do, but that's their choice. And they're focusing more on their West Coast roots. And I what, is, uh, what is something that you you truly feel is like next gen that some brewery is driving that's independent of like something that's eco-friendly because all of us want to be there right because we want to continue to drink beer but something that is just you know i guess not necessarily in the same vein as a oscar blues with the the crowler but you know just truly independent thought and driving the industry forward whether it's from a taste or a mechanization or something like that I have liked seeing how nimble everybody has chosen to become with packaging and beer to go over the last year. I have liked seeing that everyone has gone back to small batch local beer instead of working on their further distribution markets. Um, they have focused on producing regular, like North Park Brewing here locally, Modern Times locally. They've been producing regular batches of new beer on a small scale, canned and ready to go with to go cans from your car. Um, easy ordering platforms, things where you don't have to go inside. I've liked seeing them all pivot in that direction. I also oh, like delivery. Uh, yeah, I like that they've been shipping beer throughout California and to other states, and those regulations have been relaxed quite a bit. I think that's allowed new markets to open up for breweries that never had a chance to do that before because there's so many barriers to entry in a state. The revision or distribution network in the United States. That's really yes. what has Loosening to up the three tier system of distribution. I like the incorporation Absolutely. of solar. Yeah. People have been using solar power. Gary mentioned modern times. One of their big stretch goals from their Kickstarter that got them started was to put solar on the building. And that's something that every brewery should be doing here in San Diego. Good questions, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Did I miss any questions in the chat that came through, Tara? Uh, someone just asked for your information, so I threw the info at brewhop.com in the chat so that anybody who wants that can have that. Thank you. Yes. And, uh, Aren't there some breweries that were doing uh, barreling in X whiskey barrels? Yes. Many. Um, Many do bourbon barrel aged, whiskey barrel aged, French oak wine barrel aged beers. What's your thoughts on... on the barreling process in, in something that's non-native? <laughs> I am the worst person to ask because anything that's American oak aged, I'm allergic to, and I don't drink. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Um, so I stick with French oak barrel aged beers when I do it. So those tend to be the Belgian sours that are aged in French oak and used wine barrels. I don't drink anything out of American oak heavy char barrels because they don't work for me. Um, but I love the pastry stouts when I, the pastry stouts that get bourbon barrel aged. If you like bourbon, if you like whiskey, I love seeing how those beers develop in the barrels. Here in San Diego, there's a place called Alesmith that has anvil and stave. And you can go in the back with a password 
that they put out on Twitter when the world is normal. You go in the back and you can taste single barrel variants, or you can make your own custom mm -hmm. blends of barrel variants, which is pretty cool. That sounds kind of cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your time, you guys. I've loved that all of you are into craft beer and have gone down this rabbit hole with me today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for your time. Interested in automation like real soon, okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you for having us, everybody. This has been such a blast. Um, we just want to leave you with one final toast uh, before we say goodbye. So everyone raise your glass. May the best of your past be the worst of your future. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Hey, Connor. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, yeah, we'll be uh, likely uh, sending out this uh, shortly. So thanks again. Thank you much, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.